Okay. So if any of you read the little blurb I sent out about today's message, I'm going to explore this remarkable person that is in our Hebrew scriptures. Um, and and I'm, it is a long and complicated family history. And that was one dysfunctional family, I'm here to tell you. But I am going to try to be really brief and just give you a little bit of a picture of Jacob. Jacob lived a, some, you know, the estimates of when these people lived is based on whatever they can figure out based on any historical stuff that's mentioned in the scriptures. But somewhere between 1500 and 2000 years before Jesus was born, so approximately 4000 years ago from us, Jacob was supposed to be living. And he was, and I've talked about Jacob before with you, but it's been a long time. Um, and I'm going to focus a little differently today, but Jacob was a twin. He and his brother Esau uh, were born to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, technically, whichever twin is born first, according to the ancient laws of inheritance and uh, family strength, whichever twin is born first is the one that's entitled to the birthright privileges, even if it's twins born like back to back. Well, Jacob's twin, Esau, was born first. Now, that's important. It, that becomes the life narrative of Jacob, that he wasn't born first. Jacob and his brother grew up. They were probably, um, I don't know, early teens or something. And their father, Isaac, was getting old, and he apparently didn't have good vision, and um, he wasn't doing well. And the brothers, the twin brothers, were both thinking, okay, I want to inherit the family wealth, the majority of the family wealth. And they couldn't both inherit it according to their to the laws, they wouldn't just split it equally. The older brother was going to get the majority of it. And they were both thinking, well, dad's not gonna live much longer. I think I wanna go ahead and get this taken care of, which sounds exceedingly selfish, and it was. So Jacob had an had a thought and his mother Rebecca was in on this and it's a it's a horrible thing but Jacob tricked his father Isaac and his his mother helped him put on a garment that belonged to his brother Esau I'm trying not to confuse you with all these names but his mother helped him trick his father and so Jacob received from the father the blessing and the birthright that was legally due to Esau, the twin brother. And that was the beginning of the end of any sense of normalcy in this family. <laughs> and we usually think of twins being extremely close and and caring for each other and they didn't so esau comes in after a hard day out in the fields he comes in and he finds out that his twin brother who was younger than he was had taken the birthright the inherit the inheritance 
And Esau and Jacob got into blows, physical blows. And Esau said to his brother, and he was not playing, I'm going to kill you. And that's where it started. So Jacob's mother, Rebecca, helped Jacob escape. I mean, literally run for his life because Esau really meant it. He was going to kill his twin brother. Jacob ran to a distant cousin of the family and he saw a beautiful young woman at the well trying to move this massive, it was much bigger than I can help you imagine, much bigger and much heavier than I can help you see on the screen. But to help, she needed help because it was this massive stone on top of the well to keep animals or children from falling into the well. And also I expect to try to keep, you know, insects and leaves and trip uh, sticks, whatever, from falling into the water. And Jacob, who's on his way somewhere, he didn't even know where he was going, stops, not because this young woman needed help, but because he thought she was gorgeous. Nothing has changed, right? So, Jacob offers to help, and he finds out that this young woman, Rachel, happens to be a distant relative. Well, now we're thinking, you know, we can't have a romance between two people that are related, but they did in those days, and some places still do. So they get the, the stone off of the well and start feeding the flocks, giving the flocks water, which is, a, trust me, it would have been a lot, a lot, a lot of buckets of water that they had to send down deep into the well to get the water and bring it up and and water the sheep, the flock. It would have taken a lot of time, a lot of effort. So Rachel goes home and tells her father about this wonderful, kind man that helped her. And suddenly, her father, Laban, L-A-B-A-N, decides he thinks this young man might be a, a good match for his daughter, which is exactly what Jacob was hoping for. What Jacob didn't know was Laban had an older daughter that he decided needed to get married before the younger daughter. Laban convinced Jacob to work for him for seven years for seven years to work for him, in return for which Jacob would get to marry the daughter. He thought he was going to marry Rachel. Laban tricked Jacob, big way, major deception. And Jacob ended up marrying Rachel's sister who I'm sure was a perfectly lovely young woman, but it wasn't the woman Jacob wanted. So Jacob goes to his father-in-law and complains. And his father-in-law said, well, you know, I had two daughters and I had to marry off the older one first. And, and besides, if you'll work for me for seven more years, then you can have Rachel. And he did it. I don't know about any of you guys, but would you have worked for nothing for 14 years <laughs> to get a woman? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and literally, the only thing Jacob was getting out of it was whatever he could manage to earn from taking care of these sheep because Laban wasn't paying him. So that's another story that's, there's, there's so many lies in this story that 
it would take a day or two to talk about all of them. But Laban tricked Jacob again, not just in which daughter he got to marry, but he told him, okay, you can have the wool from the sheep that are spotted or that are black because nobody wants that wool. And I, the owner of this ranch, I get to keep all the sheep and the wool that are all white because that's what people want. Nobody wants a sheep that's part black and brown and white. And nobody wants a sheep that's all black because the only thing black wool is good for is for funeral apparel. And, and Jacob agreed to it. And I don't know who was tricking home, but they were both trying to manipulate the other. And supposedly Jacob came up with some sort of scheme that doesn't, uh, from what I can tell, there's absolutely no scientific evidence that this would work. But somehow he, he had the sheep looking at something in nature that would have caused the wool to change colors. I don't know. The scripture does say that Jacob ended up with a huge herd of sheep that were his after the 14 years. And finally, he got to marry the love of his life. So eventually, Jacob had, remember, this was normal at that time. Polygamy was not considered sinful or anything or out of the ordinary. There was always, how many sons can you have? And the more women, the more sons were likely. So Jacob ultimately had four wives and several concubines and a whole lot of children, many of whom were boys. So they had a lot of sons. So as you can probably imagine, Jacob and his new wife weren't getting along splendidly with Rachel's father. There was all kind I can you imagine Thanksgiving meal at that house? There was all kinds of confusion and anger and resentment and trickery and deception and I mean you just name it. It was it was a soap opera for the ages. And Jacob decided he had had enough of Laban. And he had all these sheep now that were all different colors. And he thought he could, and he had a lot of family now, wives and concubines and children. And he thought, I can leave this place and not be a, a servant of Laban anymore. So he gathered everybody up and he said, we're sneaking out in the middle of the night. We're going to get away from him. And we're going to go find our own place to live and set up our own family space. We're not going to be under Laban's control any longer. And as you can imagine, Laban was not happy about that. And so he comes after he was trying to catch up with Jacob and this huge group of people and flocks and children and In the meantime, Jacob gets word that his twin brother, remember him, Esau, whom he had wronged decades earlier, trying to take their father's inheritance. He get, Jacob gets word that Esau is coming to find him. Esau. The last Jacob heard of Esau was that Esau was going to kill him. And Jacob assumes that Esau still is going to kill him if he finds him. So this parade of, of people and animals heading who knows where stop for the night. And Jacob goes a, a little ways away from all of that. Can you imagine the campfires? And they were probably singing Kumbaya, roasting marshmallows. I mean, it was just wild. And the and the babies were crying and needing to be milked, and the, the sheep needed to be taken care of. And Jacob decides to find a little quiet space to relax. 
and he falls asleep and he has this dream. He, some of us used to know this song and I never did know what it meant. But Jacob has this dream about, the scriptures call it a ladder. They wouldn't have had a ladder like we think of a ladder. Steps that go up neatly like this. It probably was more like a step pyramid that you've seen pictures of, or if you've been in Mexico or other parts of the world, you've actually seen these, where it's not not straight, smooth angles, but steps like that. It was probably like that. That's probably what they were calling a ladder. And Jacob's dream, there was this ladder that was that was sitting on earth, which they thought was flat, and that it was so tall that it reached clear beyond even vision. It was reached up to heaven. And Jacob saw angels going up and down up and down and there's that song you remember it i'm not going to sing it for you anybody know the song we are climbing jacob's ladder i never knew what that meant i still don't <laughs> but anyway um i guess it means trying to get to heaven i don't know <laughs> um jacob realized that the lord god was right there in front of Jacob. Picture that. How whatever your image, however you can image whatever that looks like, Yahweh God was right next to Jacob. Promising to always be with him. Jacob was still terrified that his brother Esau was going to catch up with him and kill him. But there was something incredibly comforting and hopeful that Yahweh God promised to be with him. And he got up from that place where he was sleeping and he was a changed man and he was still frightened of his brother. But he thought, maybe I'm not alone in this. And there's a long, long story about how Jacob and Esau eventually meet. But just keep in mind that Jacob was literally terrified of encountering his twin brother, whom he had wronged decades earlier. And when Jacob and all of his herd of people and animals and groceries and buckets of water, whatever they had to carry with them, diapers, who knows, all of the stuff and all of the people, when they got to close to where they thought Jacob's brother was, Jacob said, you all stay back. You all stay back. I have to do this by myself. But first he sent out groups of people and animals and crops and vegetables. And every, every group had a spokesperson who said, Jacob is giving you this. Jacob is giving you this. And on and on it went. And if it sounds like it was a bribe, that was exactly how it was intended to be. And eventually, Jacob and Esau come face to face. And here's the thing. Jacob had held on to resentment and regrets and anger and fear 
for his whole life. And Esau had let go of that a long time previously. And Esau welcomed his brother with open arms. And I expect both of these men wept. They hadn't, they were twins. I, I never had a twin, and maybe some of you did, but their, their closeness was, was not just emotional, it was genetic. And they had been apart for so long. And Esau had let go of all of that, even though he was the one that was wronged. And Jacob said to his brother, to see your face is to see the face of God. Remember, Jacob had recently had a vision of God saying to him, I will always be with you. I will always love you. And suddenly his twin brother, whom he had treated so badly and nurtured so much hatred for so many years, his twin brother is greeting him and loving him. And Jacob says, to see your face is like seeing the face of God. And there's one more thing I want to tell you about this complicated story. The scripture says that when their father died, both of the brothers came together to bury him. So here's the question. Here's the question. Jacob spent most of his life in a spirit of resentment and envy and hatred. And I mean, you can understand why. You can understand why he felt like he was he was the brother that wasn't loved as much. He was resentful about Laban, causing him to work for this man for so many years for free. There were so many issues in his life that he never ever let go of. He just hung on to them like they were precious jewel and they were poison. And how did he get from all of that greed and jealousy and ugliness? How did he get from all of that to be considered one of the major representatives of the faith of the holiness of God. How did Jacob go from all of that to be considered one of the major teachers of loving God? And the scriptures don't tell us that. But this is what Linda thinks. Linda thinks there's only one way that could have happened. And it was grace. And it was forgiveness. He had to forgive himself for all the people he had wronged intentionally. It wasn't an accident. He had to forgive himself for that, for for. for abusing his own father and his own brother and his father-in-law and how he had how he had not treated his his first wife Leah with the kindness and the dignity that she deserved he had to forgive all the people and he had to forgive himself 
And that came when he encountered God face to face. And any of us who have lived more than a couple of years know that forgiveness doesn't usually just happen like that and it's over and it's done with and never more like do i bring up those memories and those images and those resentments it 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 sometimes it takes years and sometimes it takes a lifetime to let go of all that poison and i'm still working on some of them and maybe you are too But with the help of holiness, the angels that were going up to heaven and coming back down to help bring the message of holiness and the help of a relationship with the living God, Jacob was able to become the representative of peace and holiness and goodness. And he's 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 honored in all three of the major monotheistic traditions. He's honored Judaism, Christianity, and Islam because of what a good man he became. And I think all of us are on that journey. And it's a journey that I think takes most of us our entire lives to become to become illustrative of the spirituality, the holiness that we claim to represent, that we claim to believe in. The, and you may want to stop recording now.